Willkommen meine Freunde. This is the third installment of our all too infrequent ramble and roam through the best each decade of the classical canon has to offer. For those playing along at home, we've previously essayed the 1920s and the 1930s at the link down below, and this installment is the 1940s. Again, usual rules apply, it's not a countdown, it's actually ordered very roughly by genre and year of release, and only one turn per artist. So you can hear the gathering intensity and velocity of the music as the emergent genres of bluegrass, bebop and rock and roll jostle alongside our old pals jazz, pop and country music, plus the emergence of albums and deep cuts. So let's get ready to get real gone with this instalment of The Righteous Bojamba. Of course, it sounds naive to say that the dominant tenor of the 1940s was set by World War II. If you haven't heard about World War II, it was like the Avengers, only the bad guy had a silly moustache instead of a glove of infinite power. Crack wise as we might, but the war had a very direct effect on the course of music and the musical audience, which endured for almost 40 years. As the depression started to lift at the end of the 1930s, the big band jazz model, which had been stymied somewhat by the economic downturn, may have been expected to return, but did, on the whole, not return. Instead, a small combo jazz from trios to septets built around a star soloist emerged and with that a radical new style called bebop. Some went a more dance oriented route and their style R&B became increasingly popular, especially in the post-war years. What did for the big bands were three factors. The immediate follow-on effect of World War II rationing, making wide-scale touring a prohibitive exercise. The musician unions recording bands intended to force radios to pay equitable play rates, but what really consigned the bands to was releasing old recordings in their old style, while the newer, more mobile bebop and R&B groups could get the latest sounds out to Hepcats live. And finally, the musicians themselves were seeking a share of the spotlight away from band leaders, who were sometimes good businessmen and mediocre players, and the small combos gave them a more suitable showcase for their talent. Some of the most legendary names and the greatest records in jazz came from the 1940s. Our selection here, Charlie Christian's Swing to Bop from 1941, was part of the formative vocabulary for guitar which he authored before his sad death in 1942. Billy Holiday still set the benchmark for emotion over technique amongst jazz singers, and 1945's Lover Man remains perhaps her outstanding artifact of the decade. Dizzy Gillespie's Sure Enough is widely regarded as the first true bebop record, and also first showed the world beyond the darker New York clubs and their hepcat habitues, the frightening gifts of the yardbird Charlie Parker. By 1947, a fresh genius, and that is not a word I bandy about easily, had entered the fray, one capable of giving the fearsome technical proclivities of bebop a voice within a more classicist framework, Thelonious Monk, with his daring and groundbreaking round midnight. Come the end of the decade, the man who was half instigator, half iconoclast, Miles Davis, was tearing at the foundation of Bob with his first birth of the cool sessions, laying the ground for the West Coast style that duped it out with East Coast hard Bob for most of the 1950s and 60s. On the R&B side of things, there were great records from standards like Freddie Slack and Willie Bradley's 1941 Down the Road a piece, to the Ink Spots who always had a slick line in jive patter with their 1943 classic Don't Get Around Much Anymore. Nat King Cole pushed R&B into a world of streamlined jive cool with Route 66 in 1946. Nat Cole deserves his own edition here, an amazing and underrated influence and no mention of R&B in any decade would be complete without a nod to Lewis Jordan, a man called the father of R&B, who, along with Bob Wills, I believe to be the biggest single originator of rock and roll. A man who had 18 number one hits in eight years. Only Drake, Stevie Wonder and Aretha Franklin have had more, and they took a lot longer to rack their tallies up. And one of a bare handful of black men who had a number one country hit. He had three, as did Nat Cole. Jordan's brand of swinging up-tempo R&B was hugely influential on Chuck Berry, who modelled his guitar style around Jordan's horn charts, and Little Richard, who copped his vocal style. We also simply have to include Snatch and Grab It from the first queen of R&B, Julia Lee, which spent three months on top of the charts in 1947.
As we discussed in TRB 37, country music was accelerating and throwing off the staid cowboy tradition and the strict Appalachian structures on which it was built. Its audience led this as much as its musicians. The war economy drove rural whites away from the farm and westward, perhaps following kinfolk who'd emigrated during the Dust Bowl, or perhaps purely lured by war jobs in the California and Washington economies, or eastward to the Baltimore and Virginia shipyards. Have I ever expounded my theory that travelling songs in country music follow railroads east and travelling songs in the blues follow roads north-south? No? Well, that's my theory. Prove me wrong. And just as the blues built its legendary club culture in Detroit and Chicago and St. Louis, wherever the hillbillies went, the honky-tonks sprung up. Another huge factor in the growth and evolution of country music was the publication in January 1944, after the recording strike had ended, of the most played jukebox folk records in Billboard magazine. This chart was based purely on jukebox plays, which meant it was focused very heavily towards what was being played in the honky tonks. The first ever number one for seven weeks was a record released in 1942, Pistol Pack and Mama. Back then the publishing title charted, so three artists shared the number one spot for the same record, but it's generally accepted that Al Dexter's version was the biggest seller. Amongst the other selections this week, Gene Autry's enduring classic You Are My Sunshine, written by future Louisiana gubernatorial type Jimmy Davis, whom I believe we met in our 1930s cavalcade performing the saucy red nightgown blues, and possessor of a melody that is as timeless as it is instantly recognisable. As previously discussed, Ernest Tubbs' Walk on the Floor Over You helped shape the style and tenor of Honky Tonk. We leap forward to 1947 with Honky Tonk thriving in the post-war boom to one of the greatest guitar heroes not only of country music but of guitar herodom in general, Merle Travis. A legitimate hit maker with Capitol Records, Travis was bound there by a deal that signed him only as a vocalist. He made up for this by playing guitar on just about everybody else's records and getting a special dispensation on certain sub-labels to do things like Merle's Boogie Woogie, where he rocked the world multi-tracking and very speeding his own guitar, which was at the time unheard of. Eddie Arnold dominated from late 1947 through to 1949, spending 55 out of 61 weeks at number one with half a dozen records from November 1947 to the end of 1948 and having five further number ones in 1949. Between he and Jimmy Wakely, no one else hit number one for 17 months. That run kicked off with the delicious Elvis-covered ballad, I'll Hold You In My Heart. And finally in 1949, after his own 16 weeks at number one with Lovesick Blues, we have a song some folks say is Hank Williams' masterpiece, I'm So Lonesome I Could Cry. A song Elvis called the saddest song he's ever sung, and one that perhaps brought Williams' reputation as the hillbilly Shakespeare into a reality. His only theme went something like this. Howdy everybody from near and far. You want to know just who we are? We're the Texas Playboys. So, while small combo Honky Tonk forged ahead, its country compatriot, the larger ensemble Western Swing, was in the middle of a 15 year golden age in the 1940s. Western Swing was generally a jazz inflected form of cowboy and range songs, although it also very heavily incorporated straight blues. The king of Western Swing, or more correctly, the friendly king of Western was Bob Wills, an amiable chap from the town of Turkey, Texas, who loved big crowds, blues music, and a little too much to drink. I could have chosen 30 songs from Wills, his catalogue is amazing, but I've picked what I think is the most important, Ida Red from 1940. Compared with his 1938 version of this song, which is a straight Texas fiddle dance and great fun to boot, this version was pounding drums and rollicking bass in a dirty, overdriven, loud electric guitar solo from Junior Barnard. If I were, under pain of something horrible happening, asked to point out the first true rock and roll record, this is the one I'd pick. I'd be wrong, but so would anyone else who tried the same thing. As Will said in 1958 when he was asked what he thought of rock and roll, I like it fine, I've been playing it since 1928, I just wish I thought to name it so. Al Dexter's Pistol Pack and Mama has to be included as it is a delight, and Spade Cooley one of the most despicable and wretched excuses for humanity ever to disguise his wickedness behind music, warrants inclusion for his Oklahoma stomp. Cooley's billing as the king of western swing is the reason Bob Wills was built as the friendly king. 
because Cooley was definitely not a friendly chap. He was sent away for life in prison after torturing and murdering his wife Ella in front of their 11 year old daughter. He spent just over eight years in jail before being pardoned. While awaiting final ratification of his pardon, he was given a three days furlough from the jail to go and play a concert to benefit police officers and drop dead backstage. A truly horrid man. Rounding out a selection, we have Roy Hogsheed's version of a song more closely associated with Johnny Cash, Cocaine Blues, and Whoa Sailor by Hank Thompson, later to become one of the superstars of Honky Tonk. But he's working close to the western swing here, but with an edge, a drive that begins to step into the territory of the small combo Honky Tonk music that was being picked up by the young guys who'd come back from the war and the teens who sought to emulate their song foi with a anti-authoritarian attitude. It didn't have a name, but a few years later it would be what we would recognise as rockabilly. Another music that didn't yet have a name was developing back in the heartland of country music, a form of folk song characterised by extreme musical conservatism, lightning quick technically stunning instrumental flourishes, pure acoustic instrumentation and a high lonesome singing style, the primordial sounds of bluegrass. Early examples of this include the first big bluegrass seller, 1946's Rocky Road Blues by the great Bill Monroe, Johnny and Jack's Love at the First Degree, as well as Cowboy Copus, a name forever bound in tragedy with Patsy Cline's, with Three Strikes and You're Out, both from 1947, 1948's Molly and Tenbrooks, from the crucially important Stanley Brothers, and is perhaps best recognised in Flat and Scrub's Foggy Mountain Breakdown, which technically was released in March 1950, but was recorded in late 1949. The trek northward to jobs and a better life had decimated the black rural south and led to the 1940s being the end of the true Piedmont and Delta Blues traditions. There were still some great bluesmen and women who didn't stray too far though. Memphis was a popular destination, but most of all the new post Robert Johnson generation, not that he had much to do with the price of eggs, we'll talk about that later, had drifted north to electricity and legend. Blind Willie McTell was still a force to be reckoned with and he made his legendary Diane Crapshooter Blues in an Atlanta hotel room for John Hammond in 1940. Also in 1940, one of the greatest blues artists ever and very probably the greatest female blues singer since Bessie Smith, the confusingly entitled Memphis Mini, re-emerged with her classic and much covered nothing in Ramblin'. Tommy McClellan never left the Delta and gave us the original and best version of the blues standard crosscut saw and in much the same vein we also feature 1941's classic from Memphis Slim, Grind a Man Blues. Slow and sleazy, these aren't hokum, this is straight up Delta Blues, as mean and as intense as anything Sunhouse did. Speaking of Sunhouse, here he comes with his low down dirty dog blues. Have a listen to the guitar figure on this song, Bob Dylan steals it wholesale for his lonesome day blues on Love and Theft 60 years later. But then he lifts a lot of stuff on Love and Theft. Sunhouse is a deep practitioner of dark arts, his very voice clouds the air with sulfurous vapours and dims the sun with swirling circles of malevolent black winged birds. He turns the night cold, the horse goes blind and the mule goes lame, the cat gets the whooping cough and the dog gets the flu and you'll feel every inch of him in your withering bones. But as the acoustic blues died, electric blues stood on the threshold of exploding, especially in Chicago and Texas. Leading the pack was T-Bone Walker with his 1947 recording of the classic T-Bone Shuffle, with a guitar solo that certainly made a younger Chuck Berry print up his ears. The original and best Sonny Boy Williamson, there were two, John Lee and Alec. Why? For reasons. This was John Lee with his stomping band and quacky harmonica sound. A few years back, this band, this sound changed everything. Suddenly venues could hold hundreds and artists could be heard over the din. Also, John Lee wasn't to live to see what he started to flower. Just after the release of this record in 1948, he was killed walking home from a gig, his head bashed in by an ice pick. His dying words, Lord have mercy. Up in Detroit, 1948, saw the arrival of one of the most unique and ornery and frankly terrifying blues guitarists ever, John Lee Hooker, whose Boogie Chillum served as the willfully weird anthem of his own particular brand of cranky mayhem for the next 50 years. The first flowers of the Chicago scene, along with Sonny Boy, 
was seen to take seed. Little Walter, probably the most undervalued of the great Chicago bluesmen, debuted with Oranel Blues and finally, probably the man whose migration north best encapsulated the drift from the south to the north and whose arrival on the scene precipitated the blues boom of the 1950s and 60s. The mighty Muddy Waters announced himself with his sides on Aristocrat, particularly You're Gonna Miss Me. This is a heavy record, but Muddy had a different kind of heavy altogether in mind. She unleashed on Chess in 1950 with a song called Rolling Stone. After that, the gloves were off and the volume wore, and every possibility seemed to open up. Down in New Orleans, a unique style of R&B was cropping up. Syncopated, melodically inventive and piano-driven New Orleans R&B grew up in the late 1940s and came to dominate the 1950s. The first significant recording is Danny Barker's Immortal My Indian Red, ironically recorded in Chicago, which captured the spirit of the city and the rhythmic mysteries inherent in its music better than any other record of the era. Professor Longhair, who cast a long shadow over the music of the city for decades to come, recorded Mardi Gras in New Orleans. Dave Bartholomew is also a key player, both as a performer with records like She's Got Great Big Eyes, and a producer, most notably with the great Fats Domino, who broke out with The Fat Man in 1950. Finally, perhaps my favourite record of the whole 1940s, and the one, for me, that puts to bed where and when rock and roll began, as discussed in TRV 06, Stick McGee's legendary drink and wine, Spodiote, surely one of the songs I would cram onto my desert island sea night. Folk and gospel made strides through the 1940s. Folk in the hands of probably two of the most famous American folk musicians, Woody Guthrie, represented here by 1940s Tom Joad, and Lead Belly, another appalling excuse for a human being, whom I hope was at least aware of the irony of his song, There's a Man Going Around Taking Names. As investigated in TRB 024, the sacred song tradition and R&B vocal group style had started to merge in the late 1930s, leading to the birth of the Jubilee Gospel style, which gave us records such as the Golden Gate Quartets, No Restricted Signs, which goes beyond gospel into the folk tradition of complaining songs, and the Pilgrim Travelers a wonderful time up there. The outlier is the proto-rock and roll of There Are Strange Things Happening Every Day by the fearsome sister Rosetta Tharp, who knew the inside of the nightclub as well as the insides of the church, belting out another one of those records that just needed the title rock and roll to be a rock and roll record. Finally, in the 1940s, Pop Wars as it was in the 1930s, diverse and reflective of dreams and aspirations. There were up-tempo dance tunes to keep morale high, composer Johnny Mercer's 1945 on the Atchison, Topeka and the Santa Fe, or Ella Fitzgerald, It's Only a Paper Moon. There was June Christie's Ode to Home Cooking with Shoe Fly Pie and Apple Pan Dowdy in 1946. Why do I prefer this to Dinah Shaw's almost simultaneous? which were jaunty but not clawing. 1945 also saw Frank Sinatra cut what some folks think is his greatest ever side with Paulie Walnut's favorite ever song, Nancy with the Laughing Face, a profound meditation on the debts of love and the knowledge they may never be repaid. And to finish, I believe we have our first ever non-American record in the series, the timeless melody and the beautiful lyric of the signature song of one of the most important artists in all the Western classic canon, La Vie en Rose by Edith Piaf. Piaf had been a rising star before the war, but a scandalous reputation held her back and threatened to send her to obscurity until the occupation of France afforded her chance to turn her ability to scandalise back onto the Germans, and she became very much the idol of the common people of Paris. La Vie en Rose, Life in Pink, or Rose-Coloured Glasses if you would, is a torch ballad, not one of Piaf's signature chansons, and it simply has one of the most beautiful lyrics ever written, written by Piaf herself, which for some reason is instantly butchered the minute an American singer, I'm looking at you Bing Crosby, gets a hold of it. There'll be more from The Little Sparrow to come, but for now, she closes our look at the decade where intensity meant progress, and progress meant what lay behind stay behind.